everybody's voice is deeper to themselves, you know? Like, so, yep. like, every time I'm watching a video of me, I go, that's not my voice, is it? <laughs> like, and, then, like, and then I hear like, it, I think, oh, my God, I sound like this. Yeah, so yeah. weird. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting here thinking I sound like it's Barry terrible. Manilow. And, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Barry Manilow. Wait, no, Barry Manilow? No, I meant Barry, Barry White. White. Yeah, White. Okay. That's Barry what White. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I don't know, Mandy's a good song. Uh, so, okay. so moving on today on the Sonic Truth, we have an amazing guest with us by the name of Matt Lang. And that is me. I tell you, he's a multi instrumentalist. He's a producer, a composer, and a sound designer, amongst many other things. Um, and there are definitely some questions that I have in regard to how you use your outboard gear when using sound design. Um, as an engineer myself, I've done some sound design but not to the extent for motion picture and i imagine mm -hmm. you use compressors and limiters a little bit differently than what you would in a musical <sighs> landscape and i think those are some of the questions we're going to get into today plus some um oddball questions from our good friend here trevor I'm gonna derail this shit oh man <laughs> cool. and then some true knowledge from the man himself chris so any All questions right. you have pertaining to any piece of equipment you may have of ours you know, feel free to shoot away and ask Chris because he's the brain behind it all and he'll be more than glad to answer those technical questions. I'll be sure to bug him. I know it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We can always hit pause and rewind. Yep. So, always. <laughs> hey, man, like, you can say whatever. I just know it. I love how it sounds. So Right. Totally. You know, whatever is going through your brain when you do it, don't stop that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we love it. You know, it's every day we're like, it's, we're like kids in a candy store here, so... You know, <laughs> oh, dude, I I feel exactly the same. It's like it's such a luxury. Even when you find a bug in something, sometimes like uh, you turn it on, it'll go like. Bleh! You're just like, you're like <laughs> yeah. that sounds cool. Let's yeah. <laughs> let's make a unit oh, that I've, does that. <laughs> oh, I've actually recorded those bugs and turned it into percussion. Oh, nice. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I have this old. Um, it's and now it doesn't work anymore. But when I did, it was a a DS a Eventide DSP four thousand, and whenever you would turn it off, it would just go. Pew! <laughs> so I just recorded that, you know, and that became like a percussion in a track 10 years ago or something like that. Oh, that's cool. sick. Yeah. No, I mean, like we watched, uh, well, I watched, uh, like, um, well, we all have watched. I don't know why I said that. Uh, uh, but yeah, watching like your reels and stuff that you do where you actually will use like the, the V3As and everything and showing... Uh, I don't know, like, you're just, like, hammering those things in and making some really crazy <laughs> sounds. So, like... Yeah. I, I just... I don't know. I, I've Don't get me wrong. Like, if I'm tracking a vocal through compression, I'm going to be typically, you know, lighter on it. Um, although I will say, when I first got the very mute, or the, the very comp, um, <laughs> I had a singer in here, and I, like, just because, like, it sounds so good, and it was crushing it at, like, I don't know, at some point, like, 20 dB of reduction or something like that. And in the moment, it sounded great till later went back and like, ooh, that's kind of harsh in there. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anything else, like I've always been of the mindset, like, I don't know, I get a new piece of gear and the first thing I want to do is how far can I push it? It's never like, how nice does it sound? It's like, can we break this thing? <laughs> that's the same way we try to use it here. Like, uh, that's the metric. Like, yeah, can we, how does it, how does it react when you break it too? Like, how does it break yeah. apart? And if like, usually that's how you can identify like crappy tubes and stuff like that. Yep. Like how, how they break up, especially in like um, an LA-2A circuit with the side chain tubes, with the compression tubes, you know, like the 6AQ5. Sure. Like that's like how we actually select it is we just dime the crap out of it and, you know, push mm -hmm. heavy, you know, material through it and see how it falls apart. So, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's never used that way, but, you know, if you want to, it, it still won't sound like crap somewhat, yeah. you know. It's a good debugging technique. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, for I mean, sure. Something I'll do sometimes with like super heavy compression. Um, and some, I, at times, like it would be in the case of like, you know, using your stuff. And I've done this plenty of times, like taking the 76A, slamming that, and then that goes into the very comp. And then that is absolutely destroyed. But then sometimes what I'll do, I'll take, aside from the signal that's going in it, I'll take a sine wave, like a really, really, really low hertz sine wave. So then the undulations of the sine wave are then reacting against the uh, the other source material you're feeding in or you're feeding into it. So you get this like vroom, vroom of compression. <laughs> it's just like it's messed up, man. It sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, is is that how like you got like into sound design? Or, like just doing, uh, just like um, like 
basically just I'm um, basically just like fucking around and just pushing something to its limit and being like, oh, that's pretty cool. We could probably make like something really cool out of that. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you want to go to the root of it, I mean, I'm a guitarist like by trade. And the first thing any any kid does, at least, you know, you took you take the distortion and you put it to 11. Yeah. Like and I've just kind of adopted that same ethos through like my entire life of like let's really push this thing and whether that's uh whether it's distortion or, or maybe it's you know a, a modulation effect or something like that i always want to see like how extreme something can be because then you get all these artifacts that you never would have if you're being polite with it and it's not to say i don't like polite things i love polite things <laughs> like my favorite reverb ever is like the uh the eventide black hole which is just beautiful and lush and nothing is like that and you don't want to distort that necessarily i mean sometimes actually if you put that distortion after a gigantic reverb that gets really fucked up and that's amazing too <laughs> but um there's a pattern here you can see yeah. <laughs> um but but in general um i think like it started off you know as a guitarist and then i went to berkeley for uh for college uh college of music berkeley college of music and that's my major was uh it was called music synthesis it, now it's called something else like electronic production and design i think but um, that really exposed me to sound design in a way I hadn't thought of before. I had never programmed a synthesizer before that. Um, I had never done field recording. And then uh, I had this class. It was called a sampling class with this teacher, Michael Brigida. And I mean, that thing changed the way I thought where it was basically like everyone would bring in a different found object from their home. And then we'd go into like a little recording studio and just like record it. And then over the next week, you had to go and you know build a bunch of like contact instruments just using that little sound. And it was like, don't just re-trigger, you know, a stapler. Like, how do you turn that into a dinosaur? <laughs> and things like that just got my brain, you know, thinking in that way. And I never had before. And that's when I discovered just the sheer joy of, of sound design and that because it really becomes this thing. Like, the only limitation you theoretically have is your actual imagination, you know, cliche as that sounds. But it just, it's like this open canvas of, of experimentation and... And then the relationship between sound design and music is so interesting, at least if you're you know, using a lot of sound design or creating sound design and you're a musician at the same time, because the sound design you create is going to actually influence the music you're writing. And the music you're writing is also going to influence the sound design. And then consequently, the sound design itself often becomes extremely musical. So it becomes this very hybrid animal of, you know, you can't really tell where the sound design starts and it ends at that point. It's really just all the same organism. Yeah, no, that makes wow. sense. Yeah. yeah. That's it's it's fun too. I'm sure like doing just like trying to create something out of like that you wouldn't think that's non traditional and like making it musical, like you yeah. said. That's yeah, you know, that's just sounds like a lot, a lot of fun to me. <laughs> what was it is, yeah. and I feel like it's such it's such an important skill, um, especially now with you know a lot of music making. It's you know a lot of pre made stuff, presets, samples, you know. All that, and you know, I guess you could say I'm part of the problem because with Avid, you know, I make a lot of samples for a program we have called Sonic Drop. You know, similar to, akin to Sonic Truth, off by a word, but um, <laughs> clearly Illuminati. No, <laughs> um, I hear that's but, a real so thing like, out there, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. but it's always, I don't know. There's always a balance I find of because I I think you know giving people it's extremely important to give people really creative tools and inspirational tools. But I always want to encourage people to do it themselves as well, because not just for the sake of, you know, like you should know how to do it, but just the actual joy. Like it is so fun and so exciting when, again, like you were saying, you know, maybe you get it at like you do something a little bit wrong and all of a sudden you're getting the sound you've never heard in any other way before. And you're probably not going to recreate it that easily. So you better record it right then and there. And then from there, you could go and do anything with it. But it's like that experimentation, the happy accidents and just like, putting yourself in there and allowing yourself to try things that aren't necessarily, uh, well, traditional. And you never know what you're going to get. It's just, it's infinitely inspiring. I agree. Yeah. No, so, I, when, so when you're starting, as a, since you're a songwriter as well and a composer, and mm -hmm. you're given a project in which you have to create sound design, um, yeah. what... How is that process done in comparison to producing a record? So an artist comes in with their demo, kind of like, you know, yeah. their foundation. How does that work from the video side when they present something to you? Is it a blank slate with just video with no background? How does that process work? 
Uh, it depends on the project, to Does be it? honest. Um, a lot of times, I mean, because I've I've done a ton of stuff for movie trailers over the years, and a lot of that you don't you don't have any visual. Um, you just have a brief of you know what the theme of the movie is, and then you know some something written by the creative director that you know is the most ludicrous description ever of <laughs> it needs to sound more green, and then here it needs to be the biggest thing you've ever heard, but also subtle and inviting. And it's like, what the hell what are you talking about? Inviting. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know, but also the most extreme thing you've ever heard ever. Like it just. So at that point, you're like, well, you're high. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm just, or like, you just, you, you like to hear yourself, or you like to see yourself type. So yeah. uh, at that point, I, I don't know. I just conceptualize like, what is the idea? What is the theme? I mean, it's really the same exact action as you know, acting as composer. Where at the end of the day, you're, the most important thing is you know, exploring the emotion of you know what what that scene, what that cue, what that cut is supposed to be. It's all about expressing emotion more than anything else. True. Good. Wait, so that's actually interesting that you said that. Like, So they, they don't, I always thought movie trailers, they like cut something together and they're like, hey, put music to this or whatever. No, that's, no, they, they typically tend to cut the trailers to the music. Okay, that is, that's something new. I, I, I had no idea that's how it worked. It, and it's, I mean, there have been times where I have gotten, you know, a rough trailer to work against. And frankly, that's often nicer because I like having an outline. But nine times out of 10, uh, it's just, you know, you get a, a few paragraphs of what they're looking for. And they will, I mean, they might use five different pieces of music and 80 pieces of sound design in that one trailer. But they're going to cut the trailer together with everything that they have. Wow. So, all right. Well, it's like a smorgasbord. Now, if I remember correctly, oh, totally. was it you worked on the... Um, the latest Blade Runner movies uh, trailer, right? That uh, oh, uh, um, that was sound design, but um, yeah, that was that was a different because uh, a lot of that stuff that was they just licensed it. It was from existing sound design libraries I had done, and uh, I didn't even know what happened until I don't know a few months later. I, I got a royalty statement, and I was like, "Oh, this sound was used in Blade Runner." Sweet, oh, that's, that's uh, sick. Uh, it, it's it's very weird because like I'll look at it and be like, "Oh wow, I, I've had you know." I've had some stuff in some really cool movies. And then I have to like go and like go in the trailer and then try to find it. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes, you know, there's so it's so layered up that, you know, it's like, I don't even know if I can hear myself in here, but I'm I'll take the paycheck. But uh thanks. <laughs> yeah. You're just sitting like, there crossing your fingers when you're watching the Blade Runner thing, just being like, please be when Harrison Ford shows up. Please be I, never, <laughs> I got a good one recently though, and I couldn't stop laughing because it was uh, like years ago. I recorded uh, all the sounds of my car, and uh, for like a different project, <laughs> and ev everything from you know like slamming the trunk to you know all the sounds, all the beeps, and everything like that. And uh, neighbors probably thought you were crazy. <laughs> oh, it's, it's LA. To be honest, like no. uh, I mean, I'm the quiet one in, in my neighborhood. Oh, damn. So <laughs> with the, you know, and I'm not that quiet. But uh, yeah, so I got a license for uh, it was it was a seatbelt click. It was like an affected seatbelt click. Fast and the Furious X. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes. And I was like, this is so on the nose. That like, is so cool. Amazing. Oh my god. I, I still haven't yeah. watched that one. Somebody told me that they go to space or something. So I was like, oh. That's, that's I, I know it goes to streaming like Paramount or whatever in the next week or so. So that's when I'll watch Maybe it. Maybe it's them unbuckling the seatbelt to be yeah. extreme. Oh, no. I, I found it. I saw it. <laughs> yeah, it's like it was a pivotal moment in the in the like it just cuts to silence, click, zoom. Because <laughs> you're so low, and you're sitting there just laughing all the way to the bank. Thank you. <laughs> Wasn't that much money, but yeah. <laughs> well, you know, still laughing, being like, <laughs> this is so small. <laughs> <laughs> it paid for the gas of the bank. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, that's why they have the mobile. The mobile, uh, you just take a photo of it. And it goes. <laughs> oh, all right, the phone bill. The phone, yeah, the phone bill. There you go, the phone bill. <laughs> now, what, Mike, when you're creating your catalog of sounds, fully sounds or whatever, you know, for your sound design projects, what's the recording process? Do you have a specific type of microphones you like to use or don't use? Um, what type of processing do you print to tape, if any at all? Um, so it depends where I am. Um, 
if I'm just in here, uh, you know, usually I'll use a Neumann 184 for a lot of stuff, um, or a stereo pair of those if I'm doing something stereo, and just because I love the sound of those. Yeah. Um, if I am, sometimes, I mean, I'm being a little bit more creative, I might use like a contact microphone or something like that, and those are kind of fun. Um, outside, a little field recorder and a shotgun mic, and it's just like a little Rode NT2 or something. I've had it for 12 years or whatever, and it works. And uh, sometimes even like the iPhone mic, to be honest, uh, you know, because some it's like it's the only thing that's there at the moment. And you hear something, you just, just got to get it. it. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I'll, anything that's really around, to be honest, like it's more about capturing the moment. And if I'm in the studio and I'm creating the moment, then obviously I have you know a lot more luxury of you know really choosing how I'm going to do it. But um, but a lot of times I'm, it's like whatever I have at hand, I'm just going to use that because it's just. The action is more important to me than the specific microphone. But if I have a nice condenser, I'm going to use the nice condenser. And I just couldn't use that outdoors, of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. get everything. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then, I mean, as far as processing goes, well, now it now it's different because I have uh, quite a bit more, you know, hardware now than I did say ten years ago. So, um, I did this horror album of it was like a very sound design based horror record and a lot of that I did it a few years ago and a lot of that was just uh, slamming like the entire everything I recorded was getting just utterly obliterated through a distressor and where I uh, like above I guess up there there's you know like a central air you know radiator whatever fan and I remember just like walking up there with uh, my little 184 and just like holding it up and the sheer amount of compression, like every little click was getting totally blown out. And then that becomes something. And when you pitch that down, say, you know, an octave or two, you, you get this really low rumbly, just destroyed, saturated percussion that doesn't really sound like it sounds kind of like drums. But, you know, you also have like the noise of the fan undulating underneath the clicks. So it's like, you know, that super compressed side chain kind of thing That's where cool. <laughs> yeah. and once you have that, you can do with anything. So I, I did that with that, or even a cello, where, again, it's like slamming it through compression, and it just picks up every little nuance, and I'm not a good cellist at all. My technique is highly untrained. So <laughs> consequently, um, my, my bow technique is garbage, and you get all the squeaks and all the little dropouts and everything like that, but through a ton of compression, that gets filled up by the space in between the actual like little gaps of the bow. So then you get these really interesting textures that you wouldn't necessarily get. And then inevitably it's going to get pitch shifted down and it just turns into a different world. It's ridiculous. I, I can imagine in the, you're in the studio every day, the way your ears have tuned. You're, I, I can imagine you're going out and about every day. I don't know if you're with a girlfriend or with a friend and you're like, Hang on, I got to get my phone. You're like, where are you going? I got to get this mm -hmm. sound I've never heard before. I got to go capture it somewhere. Have you ever been yeah. in a, a situation like that where you're like in an environment, you've heard such a unique sound, you kind of just like had to pause everything and go record that? I imagine you've had yeah. to have at some point. <laughs> Once or twice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's unavoidable. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Like, uh, I don't know, I almost, the parallel to me is skateboarding. I grew up skating. Like, that was always my thing. And when you, after you've been doing it for a while, you can't, you only see the world through the eyes of a skateboarder. Mm -hmm. Where if I see a stair set, I don't see a stair set. Yeah. If I see a ledge, it's not just something to sit on. I, I am always seeing, you know, a different angle of like, say, for instance, like how would I skate it or, or how would I envision someone skating it? And it's the same thing with audio, where, you know, if I hear something, it's not just, oh, there's that sound. It's what could that sound be? Mm. Mm. That's, That's a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah, I grew up skateboarding as well, so I understand exactly what you're talking about with that. Uh, just you can't turn it off. No, I mean like every now and then I can because I, I don't know. I think once you fall down enough stairs, you, you just look at them as <laughs> stairs because uh, because <laughs> you're like you're like I can't. Dude, I'm a like, different kind of skateboarder. I am. Yeah. I am. I, I I tried skateboarding not that long like. Like probably a few years ago, I tried hopping back on the board and I rolled my ankle again. Yep. And I was like, no, well, that's why I don't <laughs> fucking do this anymore. And then, uh, yeah, I like by nature, I like automatically count stairs. Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll still count stairs too. Like all the way down. I, I can't help. I'm like silent, all the way down. Yeah. Just like one, two, three, four. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, 
No, and then a few months ago, uh, uh, what was it? I, I, it, was, it was like right after Nam. Uh, I hopped on one of those one wheels. And, oh yeah, and I uh, ate shit. Like I, and, I'm, I'm sure I would too. Those just look like a terrible idea. To they're, me. they're very fun. They're very fun, but don't go down anything that's like uneven feet. because <laughs> yeah. when you're trying to slow down and you hit a bump, it pushes it forward and just starts making you go faster. And uh, yeah. yeah, I just I just ate shit. I had like this giant bruise. I'll have to send you a photo of it oh, if I, you want to see. Yeah, you don't want to see it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've seen worse. Just, so. get, just that's how comfortable I get with him, real quick. And just be like, you want to see my bruised up thigh? <laughs> cool, <laughs> man. That's how you break the ice. After that, your brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But no, they. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm just not as youthful as I feel some days. <laughs> but uh, no, no, I, I was gonna yeah piggyback on uh, what yeah uh, Justin was saying about just being out in public and uh, and having to. I would. I, I've always wondered like, have you ever interrupted somebody? Or now I'm wondering yeah. rather not not that I always yeah. wondered. Uh, I'm wondering now. Uh, have you ever like interrupted like a family or anything just to go record something? And just be like. Shush, shush, shush. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say I would interrupt like a family's party or something like oh. that. All right, but um, don't blow out the candles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. don't blow out those candles. But years ago, um, actually, when I was at Berkeley, there was this. Uh, there was a playground, um, you know, by the school, and I, I went there with a friend of mine just to like start recording, you know, all like the things in a playground of you know like the clickety clackety metal things and the sand and the sifters and all that kind of stuff. All the squeaky swings. Yeah, and the parents became less than enthused that we were there surrounded by their kids and called the cops on us because oh. they thought we were recording their kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. I that mean, took the fun out of it. Yeah, I feel like that's yeah. like something you probably got to go do like in the middle of the night, kind of like where there's no kids around. <laughs> just be like, all right. Let's go record. Yeah, now. but then I ended up using one of the recordings of the kids in a song of mine. Right. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it was like this kid was talking about, he was like, this could move even if you put it right here or something like that. And he was talking about, you know, some like some toy or whatever. And it just the mic picked it up and I totally used it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It'd be funny if you used the parrots yelling at you guys to leave yeah. or whatever. <laughs> We're oh. calling the cops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we got out of there quick. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, cop shows up. He's going to be like, here's a list, uh, and you're about to join it. And you're like, no, 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 we're just, yeah, we're, right. we're just recording. We're just recording sounds. Pretty much, right? <laughs> so, no, no, I'm, I'm trying to stay off any kind of list. Yeah, these days, so, yeah. Same, same. I yeah. try to fly under the radar as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 that came out wrong. Yeah. That came out real wrong. That's not what I meant. <laughs> it's only a crime if you get caught, right? Oh. <laughs> I appreciate your taste, though. Oh, yes. I'm dark as hell. Like, I, I, it, it, I, trust me, it's in line with my own. So, oh yes, yeah. you and I are gonna get along just fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, we find each other. We, it's a we do. We tend to gravitate towards one another. I find. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Nam's coming up. Nam is, is coming up. And our <laughs> that's right. Oh, and well, AES yeah, also. Yeah, AES. I was about to say. I'm pretty sure you yeah. said that. Uh, didn't you just get word that you're going to be going? Uh, yeah, we could go. So I'll be there from the 23rd to 27th, actually. So are you going with Avid? Yeah. All right. Um, I'm like I'm. I officially I I work for Avid. What is it exactly that you do for Avid? Can you explain a little bit of that? Yeah, so I'm the head of audio content at Avid, which means um, basically I'm in charge of all the sounds that Pro Tools ships with. Wow. So, yeah. So everything from uh, like all like all the audio content samples and presets and all that kind of stuff, as well as, you know, working on instruments and creating new instruments. That's actually like my personal favorite thing to do is, you know, creating the instruments that can then be played. Um, and on top of it, there's an element of marketing because then I end up doing like all the videos for, uh, like the instrument promotional kind of stuff that at least I'm using and, uh, just a lot of, uh, it's product development really. Is there an uh, uh, instrument plugin that we all here have may have used within the, uh, the Avid system that you developed? Um, well, it would be recent cause I only came on board in the last year, but um, we released something called Playcell, yep. which was like a sample playback engine uh, that came out in March, I believe. 
And so it came with 80 instruments, uh, 40 of which were kind of stock, like here's your piano, here's your bongo, whatever. <laughs> and that stuff, um, I didn't make that because that's not me. But then the <laughs> other side of it, which is a lot more uh, like experimental, like some like it's mostly synthesizer based. Um, some of it though was like taking an ebo to like an eight string guitar nice. and you know covering that through you know reverb, and then that becomes this really like beautiful, almost orchestral sounding pad. Or um, there's this other one in there that I love. I called it iPhone piano. Speaking of the iPhone, <laughs> because. I uh, just to like see how it sounded and ended up being really cool. I just you know took my little took my iPhone mic and just walked over. I have an upright piano in the other room, and just like hit the sustain pedal and hit a C. It was like a C four or something. And but with the sustain pedal, then you get you know all the harmonics of the other strings and all the overtones. Mm -hmm. So then um, you know I take it into the studio, if you will, and uh, then just basically granulized the hell out of it, like super hard time stretching and made this gigantic soundscape out of it. But because you had all the harmonic overtones of the strings that are resonating that weren't just the C, you got this really beautiful, complex texture. And especially, and what I love about time stretching is anything that's harmonic, you really start to hear like the ripples and like the harmonics kind of like tear themselves apart and nudge against each other and rub. And like... Those kind of things are, you know, what I get so excited about making. Because then, I mean, frankly, half the time I'm making instruments that I want to use myself. Like it's almost very self-serving at times. That's gonna be a fun gig. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, really, it, just it, kind of breaking the rules. Yeah. It, it's a dream job. Um, I I have to, you know, this it literally changed my life. Um, I started it a year ago. Uh, I'd worked with Avid uh, as an artist for about seven or eight years before that, just because. Way back when, I was touring as like a DJ and making techno, and uh, I was one of maybe five people, at least professionally, who really who actually used Pro Tools to to make electronic music. So uh, through Steve Duda, actually, if you know who he is, he connected me to Avid because he used to work at Digi Design way back when, and uh, and I got introduced to Greg Chin. And Greg Chin, until recently, um, he was basically the director of the audio ecosystem. So uh, he was, you know. Between him and Rob D'Amico, who's um, who was his partner, like they they are in charge of Pro Tools. So anything, any new feature, anything like that's them. So I had known Greg for years and years at this point, and the pandemic just crushed me. Um, I couldn't tour anymore, and then Hollywood shut down. Like my income was just devastated, and so <laughs> I'm like. I was in Alhambra, which is like 20 minutes away from here, and I was like, my car was getting worked on. I'm just sitting there, like, what the hell am I? How am I going to make it? How am I going to survive? And I'm like, there's like this little brewery. I'm just sitting at having a beer. And, and I called Greg. And I, I think the conversation literally went like, sup, dude? Dude, I need a job. <laughs> 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 and uh, a year later, they made it. And um, so it was between Greg Chin and then also uh, Francois Corolla, who is, um, he's the VP of audio at Avid. And um, the two of them really made this possible for me. And they gave me, the absolute dream of a gig. That's so awesome. I'm that's forever indebted to, you know, everyone involved. That's yeah. that's great. Yeah, there's so many things that came out of so many positive things that came out of the that whole pandemic or things that have shifted and changed because of it. And, you know, that's that's a great story and, you know, any day you get to do something you love, you're not really working. You know, it's not yeah. they say if you do what you love, it doesn't yeah. feel like work and that's No. You know. I mean, like yeah. what I've done today I, I programmed a, a sketch of a software synthesizer I want to make. Is that the base like, one that you were um, that you posted yeah. about last night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just uh, I started you know ideating about it, if you will, a few days ago, um, and then you know reached out to a couple of people like, hey, what do you think about this? And I was like, explore the idea. So um, so I ended up like, yeah, I, I first I like I bought an Apple pencil so I could draw the thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad, because I could not do it with pen and paper because I would go through a hundred pages of paper. <laughs> but um, so I did that, and I wrote up a whole little like product brief. And then this morning, um, I went and I built a skeleton version of it uh, in Native Instruments Reactor, just so I had like a, a demo to show of like this is what it could be. And I mean, again, this is fun. Like I, I feel like I'm a kid in a candy store. I'm just making shit I want to use myself. 
I mean, that's that's like, exactly what we're doing. That's exactly, <laughs> I, I know. Like the it's same like we, thing. We, we live such <coughs> incredible lives to be able to do that kind of thing. It's it, you know, it's it's just such a blessing. It's amazing. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I was just stuffing a PCB for a new design, new or you know. Yeah. So like, there's. And it's just all stuff that you want to use, like that you were yeah. always wanted to use. Sorry, somebody just like looked in here and just waved. So <laughs> I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> You're not invited. Not to this. No, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I don't, uh, Matt, you were talking before about uh, being a guitar player, you know, by trade. And uh, same for me. Yep. And actually the first company uh, before Audioscape was actually a guitar pedal company called CBC Pedals. Really? And I would just make a bunch of like weird fuzzes. And it was just same Dude. thing, self-serving. I, I wanted to like, I couldn't afford, you know, I have starving artists just gigging yeah. and stuff like that. I couldn't afford these things. And lots of times, some of these circuits I would find, you couldn't even find them. Like they were so rare right. and obsolete. So I would just be a kid in a candy store building. Like, I don't even, there's not even a video demo on what this thing sounds like. So I would just, you know, reverse engineer it and build it and be able to, hear what it sounds yep. like. So it's like having my own music store in my garage, basically, mm -hmm. which is cool. Um, uh, fuzz it, is my favorite pedal, period. Yeah. Like I, it, it's just the most fun. And it, so, yeah, I like it totally, it's, there's so many cool things you can do and creative outlets, ways you could go. And Audioscape was sort of just a, a happy accident. I was just working with a producer friend and he wanted, he was like, I could really use the only, he was all in the box. He's like, the only thing I could use would be like an SSL style bus compressor. And that ended up being our first product. You know? That was the one, huh? Yeah. That was all the way back in 2016. So, right. Oh my, that's right. Yeah. Cause I was thinking about this. Like when did I first come, you know, when did I first gain awareness of Audioscape? And I think it, it must've been, it was either right before the pandemic or in the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, and I think it was like, you know, YouTubers or something like it probably would be the pandemic because I was watching a ton of YouTube and gear stuff and like, and I just bought a bunch of gear because, you know, we all had <laughs> so like, a lot of people. <laughs> we're, we're all unemployed. So, yeah. Thanks, government. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I bought like four guitars in that first year. But um, and they weren't like one is still the main guitar I use all the time. So um, don't regret a thing. But yeah. yeah, I think it was it was on YouTube I first became aware of your stuff and uh and it was just like oh this looks really good and then um just fortunately produced like a pro helped uh introduce us and here we are now but i mean yeah i mean you're for, it, it's amazing because i've had you know a few other like uh because the 76 was one of the first things i got from you and i you know i've done i've worked with some other 76 uh clones and don't get me wrong like it was interesting because i i put one up from a competitor um, up against yours and just even looking at like the way the waveforms looked differently. It was so interesting. And there was like this pure, like whereas like the other one had like some weird noise stuff going on. Um, yeah, yours just like, it just looked beautiful. <laughs> it was like, I, I, I remember it's, I took like a, a kick drum through it and it was like, it just looked so beautiful. And it was, it was a sexy little kick drum, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that trans, yeah. That's nice looking. It, it, was, it, it, was, you know, it was a pretty big booty kick drum. Let's not kid ourselves. You're, but you're like, like, look at, you're like, yeah. look at the curves on that thing. <laughs> I know. <Nice. laughs> it was just beautiful. So it, it's like, it, I, I knew it wasn't just my ears. Like I actually had like visual proof that there's something going on here that, you know, the others weren't doing. And I mean, it just sounds amazing. So now I, I track through your stuff almost every time I track anything. Yeah. No, I, I mean, same. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Matt. And that's, you know, honestly, it's just, it's just, just like a great song. It's a summation of all the parts, right? So that's what we're, yeah. that's what we're going for. Just, you know, is some people like, they can, I feel like they could find a way to talk themselves out of like using a certain part, you know, just because this will do good enough. And this only uh, carbon composition resistor only works, you know, great in a tube circuit. That's the only time you'll actually hear a difference where just because, you know, you can use that excuse. Like if that's what was used back then and that's part of creating the sound, you should go for it, you know, and find it still, yep. that stuff's still available. And it, so it's becoming harder to find some of those parts too, because I feel like people are, sort of falling back on what's the easy thing to do. So like, it's, it's a battle every day here, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. trying to find some of these old obsolete parts and things like that, but yeah. it's labor of love for sure. You know? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately that probably means there's, you know, a shelf life to some of this stuff. 
yeah. because the parts just won't be there anymore. Yeah, definitely. That's why you see sometimes okay. even with us limited products, you know, limited amounts yeah. that we do runs and things like that. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, because the new old stock tubes are going to, you know, you, you know, those original tubes. I mean, like the, the supply on those is going to dry up eventually. Oh, definitely. And, yeah. You know, it, it's from week to week. It, it's week to week on those for sure. You know, if I'm being honest with, with the new old stock tubes, I'm, yeah. you yeah. know, every day. Uh, Every day I'm looking for for them. Yeah, so I've been there hunting them down with you. It's it, it is it, it is it is tough. <laughs> like Just going to flea markets and no. oh yeah, <laughs> no. I did I did look on like Mercari one time. <laughs> like I just like went on there and I was just like, let me see if tubes are on here. And I was like, holy shit, tubes are on here. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't think of it like uh, like uh, I was just like I, guess I usually use that to buy like collectibles and stuff like that because uh, some people mm -hmm. are just like I just want this out of my house and I was like I want that in my house and uh, yeah yeah so I just one day I was just like hey Chris I, did, I went on Mercari and I looked up tubes and uh, here you go and I don't like just send it to him and he's like oh that's interesting <laughs> so. But yeah, no, there's a there, there's a few avenues, but yeah, it, it's all gonna dry up eventually, and uh, and then like all the new tubes that they're making now, maybe you gotta hold on to those, those. and let them age for fifty years, like wine or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if yeah. you want to let wine age for fifty. Burn them in. Yeah, or just yeah, burn them in. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Um, so yeah, that's um, tough. so uh, so what? Uh, what were your beginnings? I know, like you went to uh, Berkeley and everything, but like, what, like, what were your beginnings? What made you want to get into music? Like, what was like the thing? I mean, like, obviously, you grew up skating, so like, did it like yeah. did it all start like there, like just like the skate scene? And no, 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 no. It started long before that. Um, frankly, music's the only thing I really know how to do. Um, but no, like, my parents had me at a piano when I was four or five. Um, I never wanted to practice, which I regret because I'd be a much better pianist than I am now. But um, I wanted to like be a kid and you know go play outside and whatever. Yeah. But then after that, um, I I played flute for a year, which was the first of a lifetime of bad decisions made about women. <laughs> and then uh, then I sung in a boy choir for about six or seven years. And, uh, and that was really probably like the most transformative of it all. Cause I mean, that was between the ages of, I guess, six to 12 or something like that. And then my voice changed. I picked up the guitar and cause obviously I can't sing anymore. So now I'm going to play Metallica. <laughs> and there, there, there was definitely like, there was a threshold that had just been broken where all of a sudden it's like, yeah, guitar and skateboarding. Those are going hand in hand. That's who I'm going to be. And that, I mean, I just became obsessive about it as, as you do, you know, when you find that thing that speaks to you for me, it was, you know, at that point it was guitar and then I needed a way to like, how do I record this stuff? And I remember like I was able to get, uh, it was a Behringer V amp, like, you know, their clone of the pod, they were only like a yeah. hundred bucks. And, you know, so I was able, I'm a kid, you know, I, I asked for, for Christmas and I just remember like plugging my guitar, you know, into that, into like the microphone input of my computer <laughs> and, and I just started, you know, recording like little guitar demos and I would program beats in like Fruity Loops version one and export an MP3. And then, cause I didn't know any better. And then I put that into Acid Pro and I would cut up the audio, you know, in Acid Pro with my beats, but then I would record all the guitar stuff over in Acid. I remember And Acid. then that became how I was making, how I was making demos at the time. And I was playing in a band and, um, and then, so I would like record demos for the band and it was kind of like a hardcore punk meets post-rock metal, yeah. lots of screaming, but pretty also, um, you know, angsty teenagers, yeah. as you do. <laughs> but, um, but then I, uh, I also started transcribing <laughs> all the music in like Sibelius or something like that. And, uh, I just remember, and this is the point also where like, my tastes in music because really, I, I mean, I credit being a guitarist for this, but, you know, as a guitarist, we all like flashy guitar playing, at least when you're first learning how to play guitar because like, oh my God, like, look at Steve Vai. That's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. How do I do that? Yeah. So um, it was around that time I, I got into like Vai and Satriani, but then I discovered Dream Theater. Yeah. And like when I was 16, yeah. they were an Opeth also on like the darker side but it was just like progressive metal suddenly became like my favorite thing 
and just the sheer technicality of Dream Theater's music and, you know, the stuff that Petrucci was doing was just like mind blowing. So of course I started writing or trying to write music like that. And I started transcribing, you know, things that, you know, it was like three bars of 1716, here's 516, you know, here's a group. Like, it was just like, you know, the song structures were not, you know, A, B, A, it was A to Z. Yeah. And, yeah. and I just remember like printing out, you know, it would be like 16 pages of, uh, of like notation. And, or I guess for them, I'd like do it as tab and I'd give it to them. They'd just be like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. <laughs> and then they're like, yeah, we're like, we're, we're really into the strokes now. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Like we're clearly going in, you know, different directions. Yeah, um, I'd say so. So, but it, <laughs> yeah, so it was around that, but it was that time too. Also, um, that's when I really finally got Nine Inch Nails, and because the way Trent was, and I guess you know the rest of the people in Nails or whoever was working with at the time, like the way, especially like the Fragile to me is one of my favorite records of all time, just because the way they were combining electronic production with you know with acoustic instruments and yeah. just like like the way they were using fuzz pedals, for instance, and things like that. I mean, that's probably why I love this kind of sound. It probably is rooted in the fact that so much of like my musical heritage is very much based in like that kind of sound design. Yeah. So I got super into Nails and, and Tool as well. Tool is my favorite band ever. Um, but this is all like, you know, between the ages of like 13 to Tool was my 17. first concert. That's a good one. It was, You're ruined for life. It was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. uh, it was them and Tomahawk. Tomahawk opened. All right. So, Very cool. Yeah. It was, yep. It was really cool. But yeah, I, but continue. Sorry. I didn't mean to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. So then, um, so I got really into like, you know, really technical music, but also, and I loved like technical death metal too, like Necrophagist and, you know, Decapitated and bands like that. Um, still do. But um, that, when I got into, when I went to Berkeley and I started really getting more into like the electronic production side and also just like engineering, like music production in general, which before I was just doing it how the only way I knew how there, there was no formal instruction, you know, it, there wasn't YouTube yet or really anything. like you just, well, I'm just going to try this and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. And, those days. you know, and I really like, there is so much value in that. And like, while, you know, like, you know, avenues like YouTube are amazing for information. The downside is that it just it doesn't encourage you to try to find the answer without looking or without you know looking to somebody else like it discourages the idea of just like plugging that cable in the wrong hole and see what happens yeah you might get electrocuted or it might sound amazing yeah, yeah. that's part of the joy what yeah. happens if i unplug the speaker cable from the guitar head why does it one? smell funny in here yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> But it's like, I don't know. So when I got to Berkeley, that's, and all of a sudden I was like being shown these tools and techniques that, you know, things you could do both in the analog realm, but also like specifically digitally, like being introduced to like, you know, the way you could do same and like granular synthesis, you know, yeah. changed my mind. Like the way you could like literally deconstruct sounds and rearrange them and blur them and, you know, separating time from pitch, you know, things like that. So all of a sudden I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, like I got really really electronic for a while. And after a few years of that, I remember probably like my senior year at Berkeley, so I'm 21. And all of a sudden I like looked at the guitar and like, oh yeah, I missed you. So <laughs> all of a sudden, like those things started colliding again. And it was, you know, that combination of taking organic, you know, or more traditional instruments, but, you know, meshing them with, you know, this more uh, like futuristic style or, you know, forward thinking uh I guess, modern sound design techniques. And that's something I'm still, you know, it's funny. I look back now and minus the fact that, I mean, I mean, obviously I'm better at what I do now compared to say 20 years ago, but dude, I'm doing exactly the same shit. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, like, funny how that works. So we're always, we're the yeah. same person. You're like, you're like, sometimes you'll go back and listen to something you, that you did like 20 years ago. And you're like, you still like, you're in line with, it's just surprising, I guess sometimes. Oh, you yeah. Know? It's real. Well, because like, it's funny because, yeah, like you divert and, you know, you go down this little path and you go down this little path. But unless you make like a drastic choice, you always end up coming home in one way or another. And the beauty of then taking those little divergences is then, you know, you pick up little things along the way. Like because I was involved in dance music for a while and I was never a dance music guy. 
Like it just happened because the first job I worked out of school was with a dance music producer and composer. So I was exposed to that world. And so then I ended up having a career in that world accidentally, to be honest. But like learning all of those like the way you mix a record like that, the way you handle sub bass and like the kind of sound design that goes into that stuff, of course feeds into everything I do today. Yeah. And like I like the way I make my kick drums, for instance, is like entirely rooted, you know, in that initial like just my personal aesthetic of how I wanted a, an electronic kick drum to sound like. And it's just you pick it up from everywhere, you know, and I guess like if you're lucky, you pick up enough things that it creates something new based off of other people's ideas. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And there's a whole art to that, like what you're talking mm -hmm. about, carving those kicks out that way and dance, you know, there, it's that's its whole art form in itself, you know? Oh, yeah, no, it, definitely. I What was it? Like I grew up uh, playing, I started playing like punk rock music and I feel like yep. everything that I do kind of, even if I branch away from it, there's always that element to it, you know? Oh. So, like, uh, like I'm more, like, into indie rock and stuff now, but mm -hmm. I, I'm still playing punk rock songs. There's just not as a lot of distortion on them anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's the same. Like, you you always have that thing in you. It's really hard to get out and... Oh, you know, yeah. Probably better not to. Oh no, I, I think it's like the eternal youth and just trying to hold on to it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I tell. Doing music keeps you younger, though it does. Yeah. Like if you look at like yeah. people that are you know at a certain age, if you look at musicians, they they tend to look younger than than their age. Well, you, you know, would, you would well, you would sit there. You guys have probably seen this like meme going around recently, and it's a picture of like Keith Richards versus Mitch McConnell. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I know we're running short here on time, Matt, yeah. but I want to make sure that Trevor gets in at least one or two oh, of his we did. amazing questions. Uh, oh, my amazing oh, questions? Please. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, uh, all right. So uh, I'll just, uh, I've already thought of the ones I was just going to ask you. So, uh, and we're going to do quick answers on these, all right? Because, uh, all right, you know, running Chris, Chris like has it. a flight to catch. I got a I got a kid to pick up by five thirty. Yeah. Uh, so which I live around the corner, so we're good. All right. If you um if there was a song that was gonna play every single time that you walked into a room and everybody had to listen to the whole entire thing, and it, no matter what you did, every door you walked through, it starts over. Um, what song would that be? Dillinger Escape Plan, forty three percent burn. Fuck yeah. Sorry. <laughs> love love Dillinger. Uh, <laughs> just because it's so extreme. It's Trevor just, like, just found his new song too. Oh, oh good. <laughs> no. Um it, no, that's that's a great song. Sorry. I, I saw them uh last week. No, not last week. <laughs> it was it was a while ago. I'm like, how? Right. <laughs> no. I saw them on their last tour. Like, they're not band but, yeah. I don't think. No. No. So yeah. um uh, uh, what, what was the other, uh, in the same, uh, uh, what's the worst advice you've ever given to somebody? Ooh, this one stumps everybody. I'm telling you, you should probably quit. No, <laughs> 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 or, or, or would it be worse to say, keep going? Yeah. No, uh, I don't know. Um, Hmm. That's a hard one. I actually like I, I try to give pretty thoughtful advice usually. You don't just give anybody um, like like somebody like say like you have uh you're like that guy bothers me. I'm gonna give him some dog shit advice. Never done that to anybody. See that yeah, yeah, yeah. See those train tracks over there? <laughs> <laughs> and wait. Yeah, right? No. <laughs> you see on the news the next day. <laughs> like, he was like, shit. I didn't think he was going to take me serious. <laughs> yeah, Go sample this piece. Man, he it made it all the, the way to Chicago. <laughs> no. Well, what's the worst advice anybody's ever given you? Oh, actually, this is a funny one. Um, when I was at Berkeley, I was... Uh, so I had, I had to audition to get into the major I wanted to be in mm -hmm. and to go through like, you know, this inner, like this is after you're already in the school, but, um, but to get into this program I wanted to be in, I had to go through like a round of interviews and all that. And my first interviewer told me to drop out of music school and to become a lawyer. Oh, oh. well, I'm glad yeah. you didn't do that. Cause, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> the irony was this a staff irony member? Is twenty years later, they had they flew me in to be a visiting artist at Berkeley. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, was that a staff member at Berkeley that gave you that advice? Yeah, 
Are, yeah. are, are now were they still there when they flew you in to go and? Uh, mm-hmm. yeah? yeah, and now, I mean, it's funny, and I understand his reasoning for doing so because you know, like some teachers are more tough love than others, mm-hmm. and I'm probably like, I would imagine I'm I can be kind of tough love when I'm like dealing with like uh, up and coming musicians too, just because like the reality is music's hard, it's yeah. really hard, and you're most likely not going to make it. Yeah. Like it's just, you know, it, it's like the only way you make it is you just have like that sheer drive that nothing is going to stop you. And so like by sheer desperation you have to make it. But a lot of people don't have that. You know, like you know, the, it, like it's really fun and I like doing music and blah blah blah, but you know, when the going gets hard, oh, I I might pivot, I might try something else. Um Thank and that you, that's a reality. So um I understand where he was coming because I think the context of it was he was probably mad, well, you know, what if you get this a job where, or, you know, you got a brief or a, a gig where they want you to write music in this certain way and that's not in your style. And I'm just like, no, nah, not going to do it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do it my way. And, and and because I was, and, you know, we, so we basically started arguing about how it would be done. And it was in that context they told me you should drop out of music school and become a lawyer if you're going to do this. So maybe You're he was good joking, at debating, just took be an attorney. Like, <laughs> and, but, that's um, and I, I love legal shows, truthfully, but um, I'm a creative. <laughs> I'm not... Ding, 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 ding. But um, but the irony is, I've never forgotten that, and that was, I mean, that was 19 years ago. Wow! So it's it's pretty funny. So that you know, that would be the that's the most memorable bad advice that I obviously didn't take. Yeah, and but, and, and obviously it like it, it stuck with you. Yeah, as we're well. not doing this through legal Zoom. So right, you know, yeah, <laughs> I mean like. <laughs> But yeah, it stuck with you. So I mean, obviously, right there, you're uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, like well, kind of like funny, f- would fuel you in a way, being like it totally did. It was like you know, it, at the time, and given I was only eighteen, but you know, like it, it felt to me like an attack on my identity, an attack yeah. on my dreams. And again, now like going back, like you're talking like punk rock. Like I mean, I. I was in a punk, I, I had my punk phase and played in that band and everything like that. And skateboarding, like you can't take that, you know, DIY fuck you attitude out of someone who's been going through all that stuff. Like that's yeah. just in you. Yeah. And like, sure, we're more reserved now, more responsible, but you know, I'm not running away from cops like I used to, you know, not for crimes, but <laughs> right. you know, skateboarding and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I still have that thing I of the minute someone steps. says you can't do it. It's like, <laughs> oh, you bet your fucking ass I can do it and I'm going to just to spite you. And, you know, it's that, <laughs> that's always going to be kind of in there. You know, it, it's it's at bay. It, it's, you know, nine years of therapy. I'm pretty chill As these you- days. <laughs> 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 and getting older too, it kind of puts it at bay a little yeah. bit, but there's always, you know, I mean, look at Neil Young, right? I mean, he's yeah. still got it. Yeah. He's look still got Mick. that attitude. I mean, you know? But it, it's and like- And I think it's- No, go ahead. I love man. being ch- like- it's just being challenged is such a good thing it, because yeah. like y- you need somebody to give you that push that like makes you get over that hill. So yeah, the irony of, you know, that teacher at the time giving me advice that I was really, uh, you know, I, I guess I, you could say I was, you know, hurt by it at the time. Now I look at it and it's like, thank you. And, you know, and we, we've, you know, we've seen each other since then. And, you know, I, I, I respect, the world of him and everything like that. And he's a really wonderful person and very talented guy. And I totally under like I, I would be hard pressed that if I had a kid like me who was arguing me, I might say the exact same thing. I do it to my kid all the time. Kind of wake them up. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but uh, it, it, you brought up something I, I found uh, really interesting. And yeah, you have to be pushed or, you know, a lot of, I feel like a lot of people that are successful and whatever they do, their their backs against a wall and it's either that fight or flight sort of mentality. And mm-hmm. it's, mm-hmm. you know, how do you react? And, you know, a lot of times people that are successful in whatever field, their back was against the wall and they're, they never even like, get out of that mentality. They're always, they're, you know, it doesn't matter how yeah. successful they are. They they envision themselves still backed up in that corner, you know, and they have to do something about it, you know? So uh, I don't know if you do this, but I totally do where I create situations where I'm backed up against the wall. Oh, yeah. yeah. All the uh, time. Yeah. All the time. Because then I, I, I'm really good. I love working under pressure. I find that, you know, exciting. So if I back myself up against a corner, maybe I let a deadline go too long or something like that. But then in a way that forces the best work out of me because it's literally out of desperation at that point. 
and yeah. it's pure. Same. Yeah, that's yep. yeah, it's it, it's a lot more exciting and it does get does induce more stress for sure, you know. Sometimes you feel like you want to jump off the hamster wheel, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Same for sure. That's, you know. Yeah, no. It, uh yeah, the stress will definitely uh get the best performance out of me for sure. <laughs> like, for, mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah, yep. but no, that's no, but I just found that was an interesting point that you brought up. So I've, you know, got me yeah. thinking about that. Got to persevere. Yep. Yeah. You know, yep. regardless. That's true. No, I think that last story that you just told, though, is uh, I think that's the perfect thing to end on. I like, think so, too. I, I think, like, everything just kind of comes full circle and everything. Would, uh, would you like to be back on the podcast but in person at AES? Oh, hell yeah. Ooh, Absolutely. Yeah. It'll be a, it'll be, it won't be an hour. Or no, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a condensed down yep. version. Just kind of like a, hey, a catch up. And like, uh, are yeah, we going to yeah, have yeah, no, be mean, some I, sound I, design <laughs> samples? Let's go yeah. run. Let, yeah. that, you, actually, that would be pretty funny. That yeah. would. Just walking around <laughs> AES trying to sample people. Oh, yeah. my God. I will that go would around and do that with you. He's got the hot dog costume too, I, right? I do have a hot yeah. dog costume that I'll, like, I oh like to wear. Um, just Does because, it say Audioscape like, on the dog itself? No, it should, but no. Uh, I, 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 he had a scooter last year, though, with the hot dog costume. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, somebody had a scooter there, and then I, I was just like, oh, I'm just going to ride this around the Javits Center. It's a on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> If you can do it really fast and you make like a battery powered portable 1176, <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> Chris, hate to hate to throw more stuff on you. <laughs> <But> hey, <laughs> we'll make it so Trevor powers it by by motion or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We just need a little like a, a little 1176 like, with a crank on the side of it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, hurry up, hurry up, buddy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Like, hold on, it's not right. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Like, no matter how fast I spin and how, like, it just will not get that, up to like spec. <laughs> that it's actually, it, it's like an optical compressor. You know, the faster you spin, the harder the ratio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, that, that's that's a good idea. Maybe not this AES. Maybe next. <laughs> We're going to need something to announce next year. <laughs> just, now our cranked, our our, uh, <laughs> our 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 cranked units, uh, our cranked series. Yeah, it goes right next to Rect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, but no, Matt. Thank you so much for taking time yeah, out of your day you, and doing thank this. You. And uh, oh, uh, oh, it's a pleasure, you guys. Would definitely love to. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't wait to see you in October. And uh, yeah, man, me too. Not yeah. too long. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't know if there's any after parties going on or anything like that, but I will totally go and do field recording with you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I um, I don't think I have any particular agenda. Um, I don't have to be locked to the booth or anything. I just kind of get to, as far as I know, I'm just there taking meetings and talking to people. Hell yeah. So um, yeah, I, I can just come by and we can just hang. Yeah, definitely. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Yeah, Love it. Yeah, we'll send you the booth number and all that good stuff. I don't remember it off the top of my head. It's right, it's kind of near I'll, the even tide area. I'll find you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not gonna be that hard. But yeah, we'll uh, yeah we'll we'll talk beforehand and just figure out the time and all that. Uh, well, uh, well, oh, if yeah. you want to, uh, I'm I'm sure you've watched plenty of these episodes. Would you want to do our uh, sign off for us? Uh, what's the sign off? I haven't watched them. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> 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 <laughs>